Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Erasmus House in the evening uh, lectures for the Indonesian Heritage Society. Tonight we have a fantastic speaker, so glad we have a great crowd. Keep your questions until the end. I'd like to, one, thank Erasmus House for allowing us to use the auditorium, and Michael Rauner is in the back, right at the back, somewhere. So thank you very much for that. Uh, quick, quick housekeeping. If the alarm bell goes, the best door is that way, but there is also a fire exit here. Go through, turn right, turn left, down the stairs, you come out where you came in, and then meet at HEMA on the far side, inside the compound. But it never happens, so hopefully it won't be first tonight. So let's move on to our speaker, that's who we've come to, to hear. Ayu Yutami is, uh, was born in uh, Bogor, she lives in Jakarta. She studied, of all things, I, I didn't know that, she studied her degree in Russian literature. Wow, at the University of Indonesia. And she's been a finalist in the 1990 uh, Wajah Femina Beauty Pageant. She gave up, she didn't win. I mean, I don't know that you didn't win, but she doesn't like makeup, so she didn't go on any further. But basically, she's a journalist, she's a writer, she's been involved in um, publications like Humor, Matra, Forum, uh, Kendilian, and DR. And in 1994, just before Suharto, or at the time Suharto banned three magazines, Tempo, Editor, and Detic. She joined the Alliance, uh, Alliance of Independent Journalists, uh, basically an underground movement. So in that, that period, she wrote anonymously the Black Book on Suharto corruption. I think still on sale. I mean, I'm sure you can buy copies, but I'm still, we're still interested. Her first novel was in 1998, Saman, and that was uh, published just weeks before Suharto fell from power. And for that, she won the Jakarta City Council first prize for, for literature and, and caused a sensation amongst that community. It sold more than 100,000 copies and it's been reprinted 34 times. So go out, make it 35. And currently, she's not idle. She's currently involved in uh, Radio 68H, which is a news uh, station here in Jakarta. So she's still active, and in 2008, she wrote uh, Susila's Trial, and uh, is, as I say, still, still going strong. So let me get off, and let's talk about taboos and uh, traditions. So Ayu, come to the stage. Thank you. Shall we start? Yeah, I would like to thank uh, the Indonesian Heritage Society and the Erasmus Heights for inviting me to be here uh, in the, speaking in the very respectable forum. And I would like to also thank all the audience for being here to listen and hopefully to share uh, your opinions on this very important topic. Tolerance, uh, what happened? Tolerance and intolerance is a very pressing issue They manage, uh, they, something happened, but tolerance or intolerance is very pressing issues today. It will have impact on us sooner or later. Uh, actually, I wanted to start to this presentation by showing you some pictures. Uh, but bef uh, while waiting for the... Yeah, okay, the first picture is actually uh, a picture I got from the internet, so it is uh, published already. The two men are convicted of homosexual criminal offense in Aceh. And uh, we see a crowd who is very eager to watch the punishment, and they are holding up their uh, handphone to record the punishment. You see a crowd of fami a, a women also no less excited. And 
please pay attention not uh, to the convict, but to how people record this. And if you go to YouTube, I mean, if you, you, can, you just can go to YouTube, you will see and hear people uh, cheering and shouting at every lash. Yeah? LGBT is not a geological wisdom. Communism and LGBT has to be eradicated so they connect communism and LGBT. LGBT is a disease uh, plague. And this is, I think, already in Yogyakarta, not only in Aceh. Uh, having watched this picture, it is, re uh, it, is, uh, it is better for us to remember that anti-LGBT was not heard in Indonesia's history. So it's a very uh, new phenomenon. Now let us continue to the next pictures. This is a statue uh, by very prominent Indonesian artist Nyoman Warta. It is titled Tiga Mojang, or Three Ladies in Bekasi. And it is condemned by certain Islamic groups as either a representation of the Christian Trinity or being too sensual. And it has to be dismantled. And we, in the dismantling process, we see a man seems to be enjoying groping the breast of the statue. And this is another uh, dismantling process of a statue, a monument that was built by the government, the local government and a business uh, a company in Sidoarjo, Monument uh, Jayandaru. And this is a statue of, I think this would be uh, Arjuna, a hero from Wayang story. Wayang story came from the epic Mahabharata. It was also uh, protested, and then in total it was, uh, there, there were four statues of Wayang heroes burned and destroyed in Purwakarta. So, again, this is another uh, picture of the dismantling of a statue of a Chinese warlord in Tuban. All happened between 2015 and 2017. Again, destruction of statues or iconoclasm had never been heard in your nation's ancient history. The first recorded case was the 1985 Borobudur bombing that damaged nine stupas on the upper level of Borobudur. So we started to see iconoclasm only in 1985. Um, we may ask the question, when did intolerant incidents start to take place in Indonesia? Here is a list, a very rough list I made uh, about of the earliest records of incident that may connected to intolerance. Uh, this list is not comprehensive nor taxonomic, and after a deep look, some cases may not fall into the intolerance case, but, like, uh, but let, is, let us see. First is anti-heresy. We started to see anti-heresy in, in the, the 16th century, and it is written, in, it's found in the Japanese literature as the case of Sheikh Siti Jenar. Uh, Sheikh Siti Jenar is a mystic, a Muslim mystic, who was condemned as heretic by the legalist and uh, sentenced to death. Um, however, he still has followers until now. So you will find in Indonesia, uh, there are some books published about Sheikh Siti Jenar, but this is uh, uh, the first heresy case that we can find in Indonesia. The second is anti-clerics. Uh, from the Dutch archive, we heard about the uh, massacre of the clerics in the 1648 by Amankurat I, a king of Islamic Mataram, Surakarta. Uh, the Dutch archive described that around 6,000 people comprised of clerics, 
wives, their wives, their children, and their followers were killed within half an hour in the palace co uh, court uh, by, uh, under the direction of Amankurat I. But whether this is an intolerant case, it is debatable. It is probably more a political intrigue than an intolerant case because the clerics were said to be uh, take to, takes to two sides with the uh, plot to topple the king. Um, but in the 20th century, under Suharta, we saw some uh, anti-Islamism policy under Suharta regime. And the third is anti-Chinese. We started to see the um, Chinese massacre in 1740, but it was not instigated, or it was not done mainly by the locals, but it was instigated by the Dutch colonial ruler. Uh, please remember that it was the Dutch who applied the policy of segrega race segregation in Indonesia. They separated the society in three categories, the Europeans, the uh, foreign Asians, and the natives. So uh, segregation is probably not originated in Indonesia, but within a system of colonialism. And it will support our opinion that intolerance is a modern uh, phenomenon. And then anti-Christian, we started to see the anti-Christian um, sentiment and aggression in 1948 during the war for independence. There were uh, a series of attacks to Catholic schools uh, and churches, and two clergymen, I think, was killed. And then we see we have inter-ethnic conflicts or inter-religious conflicts from time to time, not very often, uh, but it is difficult to really pinpoint uh, the early, earliest occurrence. And then, since 19, 1966, we started to see the anti-communism mixed with anti-atheism. 1985, again, we see the iconoclasm of the Borobudur Temple. And it is said that the bombing was a retaliation of an anti-Islamic massacre a year before, the Tanjung Priok case. And then after 2000, it is after Reformasi, we started to see anti-pornography and porno action. I know the word porno action or porno action is not anywhere in the dictionary. Even the Indonesian Official dictionary doesn't have an entry of porno axi. Uh, it's a new word coined by the legislators to expand the meaning of pornography in order to criminalize not only the production of pictures and texts, but also to include behavior, to criminalize behavior that they think are not uh, uh, not based on the Sharia law. And then also in the, around the same time, we have anti-LGBTs after reformasi. Actually, it has happened, I, I think, only uh, this past 10 years. So what, would, what could we say about this fact? Intolerance is a modern phenomenon in Indonesia. It is known in Indonesia's history only after the introduction of monotheism and modernity. What do we mean by monotheism here? Since uh, uh, Jewish is not acknowledged as religion in Indonesia, monotheism means Islam and also Christianity, but we will practically talk about Islam as nearly 90% of Indonesia's population are Muslim. Islam had made an entry in Indonesia in 11th century, but, or probably earlier than that, but it started to gain uh, domination in the 15th or 16th century. 
And what do we mean by modernity here? Scholars usually agree to define modernity as either a historical period, a sociocultural norm, and a philosophy developed after the Middle Age, or the sum of them, with strong emphasis on humanism, reason, technology, and market economy. Humans are being freed from the grip of God, and by using the reasons only, they can create technology and rule the world. Modernity is considered to start in the 16th century Europe, after following the Renaissance. But it didn't take too long for the development in Europe to have an impact in Java, Sumatra, and the surrounding islands through colonialism. At the end of the 16th century, the Dutch explorer, Cordelis de Houtman, arrived in Banten, seeking for the Spice Islands. And it would mark the 350 uh, years presence of the Dutch uh, rule in the archipelago. And interestingly, the year the Houtman landed in Banten, which is 1596, is also the year in which the great philosopher, the father of modern philosophy, René Descartes, was born. So modernity is the spirit of that age. And Indonesia is not isolated from that spirit through colonialism. You like it or not, colonialism introduced to Indonesia a modern mechanism of control by way of division, categorization, and appropriation. And curiously, it is after the entrance of Islam and the Western modernity that intolerant incidents started to be seen in Indonesia. But the question is, is that true that the ancient pre-modern... Sorry, uh, how come... I pressed the wrong button? Man, I don't... Uh, probably I can do it with my computer. So the question is, is that true that, uh, see? <laughs> the question is that true that ancient and traditional people of Indonesia were tolerant? That's what we believe, and that's what our founding fathers believe, and that's what many sources like academics and scholars um, said about our past. Uh, but I also ask that question and try to get some answer or some new answers by rereading the mythology and folklore. And let me give you three illustrations from uh, some uh, uh, historical epoch in Indonesia. This is the performance of Chalon Aram. If you go to Bali, probably you have seen uh, this performance. A Chalon Arang is uh, considered to be, is believed to be a historical figure. It's not a mythology, but it's a historical figure. Came from the 11th century, is Jaffa. Uh, the story is about the black magic widow, Chalon Arang, on uh, my left hand side, who by his dark magical power sent plague or deadly disease to Kahuripan, uh, the kingdom that was uh, led by King Erlanga. Uh, for our interest here, this story might contain the anti, uh, the content of friction, religious friction. Chalon Ara practiced a certain left-hand Hinduism. She, she was a worshiper of Durga. And later on, the king sent a Buddhist priest to overcome Chalon Aram. How is the story resolved? Interestingly, we don't see inquisition here. Chalon Aram is not treated as a heretic. It is true that at the end of the story, she got killed, but she is not killed like 
uh, the, like a sorcerer in the witch hunting in Europe in the 15th century, uh, burned at stake. And uh, unlike Inquisition, in Inquisition, if you killed a heresy, it is equal to eradicate the teaching. But in Chalon Arang, you, uh, Chalon Arang is killed, but the teaching is res respected. She was killed because she sent plague uh, to the kingdom. So we see a very different uh, approach here. We cannot find uh, and the way and the way. And if you see, if you go to Bali, you will see that Chalon Arang is still respected as a figure, even though she had the black, uh, she had the dark power, very strong, powerful, uh, dark power. But she is still respected. Only she needs to be, uh, only the dark power needs to be balanced later. But there is no eradication of teaching. And from the 11th century, we go to the 13th century. This is Chandi Javi, uh, or uh, Javi Temple. Uh, what is interesting here is that you see uh, syncreti syncretism of Shiva and Buddha. At that time, uh, we see religious frictions between, between uh, Shivaism and Buddhism, but the ancient people at that time managed to, uh, to, to, to overcome that friction by syncretism, translated into the structure or the architecture of the Temple is a body of Shivaistic structure with a Buddhist stupa at the top. We cannot really the we cannot really see the stupa, but you can imagine that on top is the stupa. So syncretism is a mechanism to overcome frictions. Uh, from 13th century, we now go to the 14th, uh, 14th century. This is the remnants of Majapahit Kingdom. Um, Majapahit is one of the most important inspirations in the construction of modern Indonesia. Compared to the other inspirations, such as Sriwijaya, Samudra Pasai, Mataram, Majapahit stands out for one reason, it treated religious differences with equality. Sriwijaya is a, was a Buddhist kingdom. Samudra Pasai was an Islamic kingdom. We have Mataram Hindu, we have Mataram Islam. But Majapahit has uh, at least two religions. Uh, but they also said that Islam was already there in Majapahit. And it is from this era, from the 14th century, that we received important ancient literature such as Negara Kartagama and Sutta Soma. And from these books, the Indonesian founding fathers extracted visions of a synthesis to construct a modern nation that unites as well as opened to heterogeneity. Bineka Tunggal Ika, the uh, nation's motto today, is a synthesis. It is taken from Sutta Soma, a work by Mputantular from that era. Bineka Tunggal Ika Tanhana Dharma Mangrua. Different yet one, truth is no duality. And this is a synthesis. With a synthesis, it's, it becomes too abstract. But to answer the question whether the ancient Japanese were tolerant, well, Tolerant is a modern word. It may not do justice to describe the ancient society, but I think it is legitimate to confirm that the ancient societies and political organizations in this archipelago were open to religious differences and managed to mitigate tensions by way of at least two, two ways. First, syncretism, like the Shiva Buddha temple, or by making a synthesis like the formula Bineka Tunggal Ika. But what is the difference between a synthesis and a syncretic? Both are about mixing. The difference is if 
your mixture doesn't have a logical consistency, then it's a syncretism. It is like gado-gado. You have a bowl, you mix everything, and if ingredients, you add the peanut butter, you can add the crunchy krupuk, and there you have, it tastes good, you're happy with it. Uh, but a syncret uh, but synthesis is more like a good drug. I know that some of you won't like good drug. In good drug, you mix everything and it takes a long process until each element gets softened and blend. And then you have a new consistency. But you may not like the taste of good because it's too soft. And you don't have the crunchiness of the uh, gori or the apa, jackfruit, or because everything becomes too soft, becomes too abstract. That's a synthesis. So from now on, every time you eat gado gado, think about uh, syncretism, syncretism. And if you eat good duck, even though you don't like the taste, or well, the Japanese love the taste, because, uh, that's why they put some, um, some sweet. Uh, think about uh, synthesis. But to sum up this period, uh, religious disputes and competitions were there, but the ancient people managed to keep the peace by way of at least syncretism. Syncretism is a kind of cushion when we have not reached a synthesis. The question is, is syncretism still possible in the modern time? It was effective in the ancient time, but is it still possible in this time? Now we leave the ancient time and we enter the next period, the 16th and 19th century, a period that can be described as early modern. This is the period in which we start to see intolerant incidents. And there is a bountiful amount of Javanese literature to better our understanding of this period. And the Javanese literature from this time gave us many records and hints to tensions, frictions, and even the use of force in relation to religious differences unseen in the previous time. Uh, I take this from Kiai Haji Muhammad Cholikin's work titled Manunggaling Kaulokusti. A list of Islamic mystics who were tried for heresy. First, we have Sheikh uh, Siti Jenar, actually, or uh, we have Sunan Panggung. Sunan Panggung was burned at stake in the Mark. And we have Sheikh Siti Jenar, who was sentenced to death in Giri and executed in the Mark. And we have Ki Baghdad from Pajang sentenced to death by drowning, drowning in the river. We have Ki Among Raga, drowned to death in the sea. And we have Kiai Mutamakin, put on trial by Ketip Anom Kudus, but freed after repenting his mistakes. At the least, we can find five names of mystics who were condemned as heretics by a religious court led by the legalist ulamas. Well, they, are may, they may not uh, are all factual or historical uh, characters. Yeah? The, histori the historicity of those figures is debatable, are still debatable, so I, I think some of them are fiction. But however, one of them, Sheikh Siti Jinnar, stands out among the others concerning the continuation of his teachings. Uh, he still has followers until today. And according to the followers, he is a historical figure. Uh, the other, we don't know whether it is just a uh, repetition of the same story, or it is probably a rendering or a retelling of the story of Al Halaj, another mystic who were burned, uh, who were sentenced to death in in, in Baghdad. Uh, but we see a new phenomena the phenomena of inquisition, which, which is not found in the ancient or the Hindu-Buddhist period. 
The problem of heresy seems to be distinctively monotheistic. In the Islamic Java, we started to see cases of heresy came to enter at least people's mind. If it is not a historical fact, it is a, it is a narrative fact. It is there in the literature. Uh, what about outside Java? Our, my sources is very limited, but at least we can consider uh, two cases from Sumatra. One is the um, conflict between Hamza Fansuri and Nuruddin Araniri, and both are from the mystical school in 17th century, and the Imam Bonjo War. Uh, the Imam Bonjo War was this conflict between the tradition group and the Wahhabi group. At that time, the Wahhabi uh, school is already there, and Bonjol or the Imam Bonjol just uh, came back from Makkah. What is the result of the conflict? With the Aceh uh, conflict, uh, it ends with Nuruddin Araniri's book being burned, but only the books, not the person. And the result of Imam Bonjol War, the traditionalist was uh, at, in the beginning supported by the Dutch, but left by the Dutch, uh, the, uh, the Wahhabis won and the uh, traditionalists lose some of its privilege. And back to Java, there are many, many books worth mentioning if you want to talk about religious frictions. But because there are too many books, if you want to start, it's better to start with these two books, which is the Baba Tanah Jawa, or the History of Java, and the Serak Centini. Uh, this is the page of Baba Tanah Jawa. It's be very beautiful, yeah? I cannot read it. Don't worry. Uh, but, Rakshantini is special because you can read it in a, in a rendering. There are versions uh, already translated, translation in, into English by Suito Santoso and uh, Kestiti Pringo Harjono, published by Marshall Cavendish. So you have access to Rakshantini. And also another very beautiful literary interpretation by Elizabeth Inandiak, and it's already uh, available in Indonesian, English, and French. So, uh, if you want, really want to read, please start with Surat Centini. And Surat Centini has to be highlighted here also for another two reasons. Uh, the first is that it has cases of heresy relevant to our questions tonight. It, and it clearly takes sides with the, uh, with the, with the convicts. It takes sides with Ki Among Raga or Sheikh Siti Jenar was sentenced to death. And second, Surat Centini is a great book that describes the uh, social and cultural life in the 17th century Java, including the sexual activities. Uh, not only are there affairs among unmarried people, about women who enjoyed having illicit relationships, but there are also sex scenes among men an explicit talk about anal sex, all written in the traditional poetry, meter and rhyme. And the writer of Sertentini managed to handle topics that would otherwise be considered taboo in that time, or even in the modern time. And this will bring us to questioning many, many presumptions about sexual norms in the history of Indonesia. Were sexual norms relaxed or tight? What are the norms today? What were and what are considered taboos? And now we go to Candi Suku or Suku Temple. It's uh, not very far from Solo. Yeah? Uh, it is mentioned in Serat Centini. Uh, this temple was built in the 15th century, and it is special in its architecture and symbolism. Unlike other temples, both in central Java or in east Java, 
uh, Chandisuku has a very realistic depiction of the lingayoni or the male female union. Yeah, you can see that this is rather special. I don't uh, we can we can find similar a depiction only in one other temple, which is Chandi Chetho, not very far from Chandi Chuku, and also built around the same time, which is in the 15th century. And I think the uh, second picture is also very interesting. It depicts the story of uh, Bhima trying to find the water of life, the Tirta Amrita. And this story is very close to a story called Dewaruchi, which is used by the Muslim mystics of, in Java. And th this is the Hindu version, and the, the Muslim mystics also use the, uh, the story in their, uh, in their method. Uh, it depicts, it, usually in Dewaruchi, we heard a story about uh, Bhima trying to find the Tirta Amrita or the um, water, uh, water of life. And then he went into the sea and he met himself in a small version and he entered his own self and then he got the enlightenment. In this story, in the older version, he went into the sea and he met Goddess Durga to take the uh, Tirta Amrita. But you see the way it depicts the, the scenes, for me it, is, it looks like an incision it looks like, like a diagram of an incision of a womb, a womb. So Bhima enter a womb. I think this is, these two pictures has some um, biological uh, perspective. What we see here, Indonesia in its history indeed had chances for open sexual expressions or expressions related to sexuality. So sexuality is not always, or was not always, a taboo. The next picture is a Reok art performance. Reok is a traditional dance from East Java. It really celebrates masculinity, in a sense that if you see the main dancer is in the back, the one who, are, who is wearing the lion, the huge lion mask. And he use, he, he hold the a lion mask by biting on the mask. So it needs a super strength to be able to carry the mask. And people believed or they believe that you need a supernatural power to be able to do that. In order to get the supernatural power, the dancer has to refrain from sexual intercourse with women. But they can have sexual intercourse with men. So this is, a, this is an old picture. In this old, I, I'm sorry I couldn't find the name of the photographer. But in this old picture, you still see the young men wearing white shirts on the side, the left and the right side of the, uh, the main dancer. And usually people will ex ex accept that uh, the main dancer will have sexual uh, relation or intercourse with the young man. So, relation that we understood now as homosexuality is accepted in a limited way in Indonesia traditionally. Uh, I try not to use homosexual relation because, again, homosexuality is a modern concept. We have to understand it in a traditional concept. Um, yeah. Um, these days, if you see a Rayok performance, especially if it is in a touristy uh, celebration, probably you won't find the male dancer anymore. Uh, because of the change of norms and because of the race of homophobia. Now, you likely to find female dancers replacing the young men. Uh, what can we say at this point? The Javanese were certainly more open and relaxed about their sexuality. 
I'm not saying that in overall they are better off than we are today, uh, because uh, things, modern things like equality, protection of minors, protection from marital rapes, were not an issue at all at that time. So I'm not saying that the Javanese in the past are better off than we are now. But we have to understand it uh, in a different way. We have to see the different points of view they have. And regarding the religious frictions, we have seen an alteration from the ancient Hindu Buddhist time to the early modern time and Islamic period in the way people deal with religious frictions. In the past, syncretism occurred rather smoothly in softening frictions. Now, in the early modern period, 16th to 19th century, we still see syncretic efforts, but they, but they did not uh, go as smoothly as before. Uh, syncretism is an or in early modern times contained or uh, seen as contained unresolved tensions and lo in logical inconsistency. For example, how can you be a Muslim and you accept homosexual practice in your community? And today people are asking, how can you be a Muslim and saying Christmas greetings? How could you be involved in a ritual honoring the spirits while you are a monotheist? To be frank, it is not easy to account for it. No answers is without crack, if we really want to see the logical consistency. Uh, Syncretism that used to be successful as the solution to religious frictions during the ancient time has lost its effectiveness in the modern time. The question, can syncretism work in the modern time as a peacekeeping mechanism? I'm not very optimistic. We cannot resort to old-time syncretism to deal with the challenge of the modern world, especially because the infrastructure and the mental capacity for syncretism are no longer here. There has been a gradual change in our brain since the 16th century on. Now our brain has lost its flexibility or capacity for syncretism. It is caused by the pervasion of the collaboration between monotheism and modernity. Let me explain what I mean. Because we don't have much time, let me invite you to concentrate on following words that have association in one way or the other with tolerance. We're talking about tolerance. What, is, what other words are associated with tolerance? Tolerance is a practice. It is not so much a theory than a practice. You don't theorize tolerance as much as you practice it. This ethical practice is passed, passed on from generation to generation through tradition. And this practice actually seeks for a unity and using syncretism. Yeah, um, remember, if you cannot reach a synthesis because it's difficult and it takes a long time and it's not nice because usually it becomes too abstract, you're happy with syncretism. And you mix everything and yeah, we live together happily. Again, it, it, it aims at unity in harmony. But because it is not a theory, the practice of tolerance is not accompanied by a set of rules. Neither a clear line between what is good or what is bad, what is enough or what is excessive. The Javanese traditionally like statements like this. Ngono yo ngono neng ojo ngono. Yeah? It's not easy to translate, but it's, it, if it is translated, it will, will be like this. You can do that, but you cannot do that. <clears throat> yeah? Ngeli mong ora keli. Enter the stream, but don't get carried away by the stream. Pungkum ora teles. Get soaked, but don't get wet. Rumongso iso, neng raiso rumongso. 
Uh, if you think you can do it, but actually you cannot think. And other similar words of wisdom that do not give you a distinct line of what's right or what is wrong, and instead put you into a paradox. The Japanese love it. In this kind of situation, how do we keep the balance? It is by way of rasa. This is a very important uh, concept in Javanese culture. Rasa is a very meaningful word in Javanese literature. The word originated in Sanskrit, but the Javanese has developed their own conceptualization. And here I am using the Javanese, not the Indian conceptualization of rasa. Uh, rasa is often translated as emotion or sentiments, but it is not only emotion or sentiments. I would like to say that rasa is the non-divisive mechanism through which we understand the presence of others and connect or even unite with them. By understanding the presence of others, we know how to position ourselves and maintain the cosmological unity and harmony. Or in the Javanese expression is to mamayu hayuning puwarno, or to beautify the beauty of the universe. For the Javanese, rasa is both the way and the truth, or the mechanism and the goal. Again, uh, on your left, uh, on my right-hand side, or your left-hand side, you see a group of words associated with tolerance. And tolerance is basically supported by the mechanism of prasa in the bottom. Now we see on the right-hand side another group of words of the opposite tendency. Uh, when you esteem uh, when you are very strong in, the, in the, the, the first group, you probably be a little weaker in the, uh, the, the next group. So if you are uh, really appreciating tolerance, you may lose the metaphysical truth. You may, you may be weak in your metaphysical truth. If you are busy with the on-site practice, you tend to forget about theoretical system. When you are, uh, and, uh, yeah. And you know, the metaphysical truth and the theoretical system are main features of modern philosophy. If you are prioritizing uh, modernism, you will be probably weak in modernity. And if you are prioritizing syncretic or syn syn syncretism, you probably lose logical consistency. Because you mix everything. You are a Muslim, but you give offerings to the spirits. It's a kind of a syncretism. And if you appreciate unity too, too much, you probably you lose your distinction capacity. And all of this mechanism is the mechanism of reason. I hope you can see the difference between the mechanism of rasa and the mechanism of reason. Rasa works by way of connection and union. Reason works by way of drawing lines, making distinction and categorization. And the Javanese culture is saturated with rasa. There is an abundant amount of Javanese literature that deals with rasa. Oh, you probably will find any Japanese literature from this 16th, 17th, 18th century, all saturated with rasa. Uh, curiously, uh, it is many times used, and probably all the time used, to argue against the legalistic approach of Islam. This is one example. This is, I took from the text Malang Sumirang, Sulok Marang Sumerang is, is considered as a Javanese mystical text. 
and it's probably one of the oldest texts in uh, Islamic uh, uh, Java. Uh, this is a story about Sunan Panggung, who, were, who was sentenced to death, and this is what he sing or he said uh, upon entering into the fire. So imagine this is before, just slightly before he were executed, he was executed. And pay attention to how important rasa is here. I've made all words using rasa, uh, bold and underlined. So sokong alet tanten singgahi ujar kupur kapir kangten ombo. Pus lowong pasti kepane tan atulu tinulu tan ang rasa tan ang rasa ni. Pus tan ono penarapan pancatineng suwong ing suwonge iku ono yang anane iku suroso sejati pus tan ono rinasan. Pan tutu roso karaseng lati tutu roso neng apopo lawan tutu roso kang kinawe tutu rasa neng guyu tutu rasa kang ang rasa ni Rosso tutu rasan kang rosso anengku sakehing rasa kerosso rosso jati tan kerosso jiwa jisem rosso mulio wiseso. Uh, my free and still rough translation will be like this. Any sin heavy or light, any curse wrong or right, the path has been decided. There is no need to look at each other, no need to feel each other, no dream. For the real is nothingness, in nothingness is being, in being as the real feeling that cannot be felt. It is not the taste on your lips, not the taste of anything, not the feeling that you would wish, not the love and not the touch, not the functional feeling, but that which covers everything, the sum of all feelings, the real that cannot be felt great and glory. And he continues, one who has reached the real rasa, no longer he prays in the division of time. Listen, if you have the real rasa, you don't need division. You don't need categorization. Uh, the question is, because Indonesia is not only Java, do non-Javanese have the same conceptualization? Probably yes, probably no. If yes, they probably use different words. I don't have any clue yet or proof, but I would say that the mechanism of rasa, with or without a distinct name, is practiced by tradition and ancient people in many parts of the world. As a practice, it may not be exclusively Javanese, but the Javanese manage to articulate or conceptualize it through their abundant amount of poetic narratives. Uh, the next slide shows a list of some variants or words combination, sorry. Uh, Ah, uh, we lose one. The next slide shows a list of some variants or word combinations of rasa used by different spiritual organizations. As I've told you, uh, the Javanese developed the concept of rasa into a very uh, spiritual level. We see rasa, rasa iling, rasa cati, rasa sejati. And, and you also see rasa social, it's a new combination, uh, but some of them are old combinations. Um, and after hearing one of the oldest texts, uh, the Suluk Marang Sumirang was uh, considered to, to start to begin or to be, to be written in the 16th or probably even the end of 15th century. I would like to invite you to see how the interpretation, how the modern interpretation, not in the literary works, but in the spiritual explanation of our spiritual organizations in Indonesia. Uh, this is 
a table of registered spiritual organizations or we call it in Indonesian kelompok aliran kepercayaan atau kelompok kebatinan as some of you have known Indonesia uh, as, an, um, uh, as a state only recognize six religion Islam, Protestant, Catholic, Hindu, Buddha, Konghucu but different kinds of spirituality and local beliefs are practiced and most of those practices have root in the ancient traditions. Not considered as religions, they are not, re they are not regulated under the Minister of Religious Affairs, but registered to the minist Ministry of Culture and Education. Uh, the data I took from the Encyclopedia uh, of the Spiritual Organization published by the Ministry of Culture and Education last year. Um, we have 148 registered spiritual organizations and still counted roughly more than 80% of the organization are based in Java. And more than 60% of the Java-based organization have rasa in its uh, spiritual concept. But I believe that if we have a deeper interview, we will have more than 100% of the Javanese-based organization that will confirm that rasa is one of the basic important uh, conceptualization in their spiritual method. Um, what about the spiritual organization outside Java? I found some interesting phenomena. Uh, there are some organizations in North Sumatra rooted in Batak local belief. There are some organizations in Medan and Lampung established by the Javanese and Balinese. There are Balinese spiritual organizations with strong Hindu affiliation. Some organizations of the natives Kalimantan. Some from Nusa Tenggara, both East and West. And some from Sulawesi. But there is no registered local belief or spiritual organization from West Sumatra or Menangkabau, from Aceh, and from Malay culture. Among the 26 organizations based outside Java, only three have rasa in their teachings, and all of the three were established by a group of people from Java. For the time being, we can assume that rasa is a distinct idea in Javanese culture and spirituality. But again, other, uh, other ethnicity or other cultures may practice a certain uh, same uh, mechanism of rasa without mentioning a name. Uh, from this, we can say that rasa is the basic mechanism that leads to traditional tolerance. A society with strong understanding and practice of rasa would likely to be open, tolerant, spiritual, and seeking for unity. This is the character of many societies in the ancient Indonesia, open, tolerant, spiritual, and seeking for unity. Uh, but the mechanism of rasa also has its shortfall. A society or, or a community or an individual that is governed only by the mechanism of rasa is at the risk of becoming illogical and static if they fail to manage their discontent after a certain period of passivity they could suddenly explode in an amok. So don't take me wrongly, I don't like, I'm, I'm not glorifying rasa, but I invite you to see what is probably missing from our modern world. Okay. Uh, after this, the next slide is a list of several manifestations of rasa. I want to, uh, to show you that rasa is not does on, does on, doesn't only have a positive quality, but it also has a negative quality. 
uh, in Javanese expression, yeah, we see, we will see a list of several manifestations put in a rating from the most refined on the top to the roughest and on the bottom. We see rasa jati on the top and we see on the bottom napsu and sere. In, uh, in English concepts, uh, it could be translated like this. Rasa jati is the mystical union I put on the highest uh, level and devotional love and synthesis, solidarity, syncretic, and we have sentiments and resentiments. Uh, we could see that the red words at the bottom are driven by egotism. The more it goes to the top, the more it becomes sublime and spiritual. The lower it goes, the more self-centered it is. Uh, the more, the higher it goes, the, uh, the more intentionality it has, if using a very philosophical uh, conception. Uh, now, on the next uh, slide, we will see the comparison between the rating of rasa and the rating of mechanism of reason. We see the mechanism of rasa are the same you've seen in the previous uh, um, slide, but on the left, my left hand side, you will see the mechanism of reason also put in the rating system from the most, uh, the, the best from the, and from the, uh, to the worst. We see critical thinking, logic, analytic, systematic, distinction, dogmatism, and exclusion. Uh, <clears throat> we see the counterpart of uh, both. Uh, we also see that the red words at the bottom of the mechanism of reason associated with a close-mindedness. The higher it goes, the more open the logical structure it should be. In the mechanism of rasa, the lower, the more self-centered, the higher, the more intentionality, the more holistic unity. And with the mechanism of reason, the lower, the close the structure is, and the higher, the open logical structure is. And overall, the lower, the simple or the gross, the higher, the refined or the more, the more complex. So both of these mechanisms have, have their own good side and bad side. What we need to do is to be proportional. Many times we judge some deeds as, be, as bad because they are illogical or irrational, as if everything that is illogical is bad. Uh, but the problem is probably not because the thing, the thing is illogical, but probably because that thing is too self-centered. So what we need to do is be uh, proportional. Uh, this concept is in English. Uh, what about it is, if it is translated into Indonesian? Yeah, this is the Indonesian uh, terms or the Indonesian words of the same thing. But you see something interesting because in the me mechanism of rasa, the jalaran rasa, we will see the Indonesian language absorbed all the words from the Javanese language. And the Javanese previously take three words from the Arabic, rukun, nafsu, and sirik. But the Indonesian absorb everything into Indonesian language. While the other group, you see, the Indonesian language absorb at least here, probably seven out of 10 words from the Dutch or the English, or from European uh, language. So we don't have 
these concepts in our tradition, we don't have the conceptualization or many conceptualization about reason in the tradition. So the Indonesian language have to adopt it from uh, European language. Uh, that shows that uh, the, co the mechanism of, rasa, uh, of reason is just a new mechanism, newly adopted. Uh, while the mechanism of rasa has a deeper root in our tradition or in Indonesian tradition. Yeah, in the mechanism of nalar, we, we can only see two words, nalar and pamilia, pamilahan, which is not a uh, uh, Western or, or European language. <clears throat> yeah, so we know, we, we know that this, mecha this mechanism of rasa is there, uh, older than the mechanism of reason, which is newly adopted. Uh, probably together with the modern education. Unfortunately, what's happened in Indonesia now is with modern intolerance that we are talking about is that we have lost the valuable parts of our old tradition of rasa. It's been very much weakened by the unchallenged advance of the mechanism of reason supported by monotheism and modernity. First, oh uh, yeah, this is the same thing, but first we choose dogmatism to syncretism because syncretism is logically misfit. So it is not, uh, it is misfit under the modern mind and the monotheists also like it. They like it, they like dogmatism better than syncretism. Meanwhile, syn uh, if you want to get the synthesis, it's not possible if we have excluded our antithesis because we, we took them as heretics or infidels or enemy. So we lose the capacity to make a synthesis because we are doing too, too much exclusion. And um, and with dogmatism and exclusion, we tend to have not a universal solidarity, but a selective solidarity, which is on solidarity on only among our congregation. So we lose if without the middle uh, rank capacity, we cannot learn the higher capacity. So we, lose the, we lost the uh, mystical union and we lost the spirituality. And we are left with our sentiments and resentments to be served by our instrumental reasons that can operate in a systematic way, such as systematically producing hoax and misinformations, like we are having now and we produce analysis to serve vested interested, interest, and our logic is distorted and made into a confirmation bias, and we lose critical, and we are not there in the critical thinking yet. So, in the turn of the 20th to 21st century, we have lost the richness of our tradition and yet to acquire the quality of the new mechanism. Now, before summing up, I want uh, to go back to the beginning of the presentation. Look once again at the picture that shows the, ri the rise of anti-LGBT. Homophobia is not, was not found here in, uh, from the ancient time to 10 or 15 years ago. What is happening to this country? Are we to blame Islam? for the rise of homophobia or intolerance, as most of the intolerant aggression in Indonesia were carried on in its name. To blame Islam in particular or religion in general is for me too superficial. What we see in the rise of homophobia in Indonesia is actually a clash between two value systems 
that share the same mechanism, namely the mechanism of division and categorization, which belongs to the mechanism of reason. Both modernity and monotheism use this mechanism. The monotheists draw a line between the faithful and the infidels, the trustful and the hypocrites, this and that, halal, haram, kosher, non-kosher, and legalized only heterosexual norms. The modern secular world also categorizes people, albeit in a more dynamic attitude. Most of the liberal countries today interpret the protection of human rights regarding sexual orientation by legalizing gay marriage or legalizing the third gender and probably in the future the fourth, the fifth, the sixth gender. But both the religious and the secular are not different in the sense that they are obsessed with legal system. No one is fighting to be free from any legalization. You know, for years I, try, I fight in Indonesia to be not married, to not get married, because I don't want to be in a uh, legal or in a formal situation. But my gay friends, they want to get married. <laughs> yeah, for me it's rather uh, unthinkable. And here the mechanism actually, um, the mechanism of rasa could give alternative. It could teach us fluidity. Rasa knows that any categorization, any identification, any form of law, command, prohibition, dogma, even the application of sharia, would always be doomed to be superficial. If they are necessary in our life, they are to be accepted with sorrow, because they are not the real one. They are not the truth. They are not the union of the way and the truth. But the union of the way and the truth is probably for many of you too spiritual. Let us say on the worldly level. What we could suggest here, the mechanism of rasa will give balance to the rigid categorization and legalization that dominates the operation of our mind today. For example, Instead of being obsessed with legalizing gay marriage for the sake of human rights or punishing LGBTs for the sake of religious law, can we drop off any kind of categorization? Can we think outside categories or can we think without too much categorization? Indonesia's history had proved that we could do that in the past when we still have the strong mechanism of frasa nurtured in our tradition. I want to close my presentation with a summary and some suggestion. The problem of intolerance that we have today is a modern phenomenon. It is a result of a certain mental mechanism, namely the, me the mechanism of reason that does not or have not developed into the higher or complex or refined level, which is critical thinking. And meanwhile, we have lost the higher capacity of rasa because the condition to nurture it is not maintained in the modern system. We are in the danger of being trapped in the simplistic, self-centered, close-minded mentality governed by sentiments, resentments, dogmatism, and the exclusion of others. Is there any hope to escape from this situation? Yes, there is, but we have to work hard together. In principle, first we have to understand that we need both faculties, we need rasa and reason. Both capacities have to be in a good and trustful dialogue to each other. Uh, second, the ideal is to acquire the highest level of both faculties. Uh, bo so the ideal is to have spirituality and critical thinking. So we need or we have to socially cultivate both faculties in order to reach the best of both. 
And this is not an individual undertaking because we cannot suppose that each individual would reach a perfect balance between spirituality and critical thinking. So the balance should be expected not in an individual, but within a society. Uh, that is the principle. At the application level, it is rather difficult, I know. Because for those who are faithful and religious, we have to change the way religion is taught at school as well as in our congregations. I know this is very difficult, but we have to teach religion in a new way, that is, in a sp critical, spiritual way. And for those who are agnostic or secular or atheist, don't ridicule religions or spirituality because it won't help us to, go to, to escape from this situation. Be critical, but open your heart. And for us in this room, who appreciate Indonesia's heritage, Indonesia has a very rich heritage. The Javanese conceptualization of rasa, which I tried to explore only a bit here, is just one of our treasure. There are many more to rediscover, to reinterpret, to recreate, and to finally offer to the world and to humanity. Please love Indonesia, and together we will explore the intellectual, the artistic, social treasure of Indonesia's heritage, and by doing that, we drive away the gross, self-centered, closed mind mentality from this country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ayu. I love your speech. It was really, really thought-provoking. I think it will give us many, many days of thinking ahead of us. We, we have some time for questions and answers. Uh, we have some microphones coming from the back. If I can ask you to keep your question to one and let us know who you are, where you come from, and then give us the question. If you'd like to speak, we are always looking for speakers, but just questions tonight. So who would like to go first? Don't be shy. <laughs> Hello, Mayu. Uh, first of all, wow. I mean, uh, I, I feel very lucky to be here tonight to listen to your uh, sharing. Um, as a non-Javanese, I also... Uh, Meza, I know who you are, but please introduce oh, yeah. yourself. <laughs> my name is Meza. Hello. Uh, I actually took Mayu's class, uh, writing class, uh, last year. And it's good to see you again. Um, my question is, uh, it will be interesting to see... Um, different political structures that we had in the past overlaid with the development uh, of uh, intolerance that you've identified. Particularly right now where we live, uh, we have adopted a Western democratic structure as our political structure right now. And I'm just wondering um, if RASA is about non-divisive approach, uh, is it possible to let it live in an era that we have adopted right now, democracy, where it is about, at some point, fighting for your cause because the majority wins. Um, especially right now, we, uh, I think every year will be a political year because every year there is going to be a regional election or so. And every year, the people have to fight uh, and to identify where they belong to get their representatives elected. I think that kind of like kind of close up the possibility for this kind of non-divisive approach to, to appear uh, or to be nurtured in our society. And it's really concerning. Uh, I think in the ideal world of democracy, after you fight and then you go back to become a constituent, you become a normal citizen having all the rasa and all. But since now every year is a political year for us, is it even possible? Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Beza, for the question. Uh, the thing is that we cannot go back to the ancient time. So we cannot go back to the time when Rasa is there to reign the world. And I, I, I also mentioned that Rasa has its own um, mis, uh, 
uh, a shortfall because it can uh, bring you to uh, absurdity. Uh, again, if a society is only um, governed by rasa, it can be dangerous too. So uh, I think if you look at, if, if you want to look what happened in the past, probably we can understand it like this. Uh, before the modern, uh, the modern uh, philosophy or modernity came, or before the reign of the me mechanism of reason, uh, people are still using rasa, and rasa can bring them to uh, some uh, good quality like spirituality and mystical union, and then they can manage frictions. But once um, modern mind came through monotheism, and here probably some of you will still consider religion as contradictory to uh, modernity, but what I'm saying here is more uh, religion, especially monotheism, is part of the me mechanism of reason. Yeah? So mechanism is of reason is not only uh, specifically Western philosophy or more Western modernity, it's also monotheism. Because they, uh, they work by, by, divide, by dividing, by categori categorizing. So let us say that after we know how to categorize, after we know how to make nations, uh, countries, we cannot go back to the to the uh, Eden, to the Firdaus, yeah, to the, the Garden of Eden. We have to deal with the uh, me mechanism of reason. So I'm not against mechanism of reason, but I think we lost the balance, and I think it's time that we reintroduce the balance. And how? I know it again in the application level, it's not very easy. But I think we have to change the way our education and we have to give um, more pro proportion to uh, the artistic, to arts. And if we teach religion, we also to uh, uh, reduce the way we teach, doc uh, the, the way we use dogmas. So yeah, we are, there's no way to go back to the ancient time. And the ancient time probably is not, uh, it cannot compare because it has its own challenge, it has its own limitation. But we, what we need to do is to, to re, re, uh, regain the balance. Hello, um, my name is Renko Mervise, and thank you very much. If I understand you correctly, you are speaking of a sort of synthesis between Raza and reason, and modernity in that sense. And my question is, hasn't the moment of modernity already passed? Um, the idea of a world in which logic and uh, critical thinking are in control um, from a Western perspective, that seems almost old-fashioned um, in a world of uh, alternative facts and truth, truthiness. Thank you. Yeah, I think the, uh, if the Western philosophy has gone very far and uh, think that the modernity has passed. And what is the... I mean, uh, what is the alternative or what is the stage after modernity, postmodern situation? We're talking about post truth. Yeah, but post truth is not, uh, I mean, post truth is what we say is there what, where, where we don't think about or, or truth or the uh, proof of truth is not important anymore. And what happened with the situation? Actually, we are. We give. Uh, we are doomed to be governed by sentiment and resentiment. And if we are governed by sentiment and resentiment, and by uh, using dogma and exclusion of others, are we going to let our life to be led by the red words? I'm not going uh, to let it 
uh, happen. I mean, I'm, I, I want to fight to get the, the, uh, uh, the best quality of life. Uh, what I want to say is the idea that modernity or, or metaphysical truth is past is probably part of the privilege of those who study philosophy, but it's not of the, uh, the privilege of people who are living in this world, who has, deal to, to, who has to deal with the, with the real life. So I would say that um, modernity in, in a sense that we are using the mechanism of division. Yeah, you can name it differently, but the mechanism of division, categorization, appropriation is still there. I mean, as, as long as you have nations, states, if you, as long as, as you have to go with your passport, you have to have ID card, you are uh, fall under categorization and legal system. And we don't have any options to get out from that. The only options is to build the other capacity uh, to understand uh, life. So, yeah, I mean, it's not past. Well, while we cannot um, go back to the past and to, uh, uh, I think there are elements or uh, things in the past that can be re reinterpreted or given a new uh, meaning. And I think one of the things that Raza is uh, in the arts, very much uh, in Southeast Asia, um, the art from Southeast Asia in comparison to the West uh, still has that element of rasa. And uh, James Supankat, one of the uh, most famous curators, has uh, widely explained on that. And he has been, uh, um, what is it, quoted in, uh, in a very, um, uh, in Singapore, when there was this exhibition from um, Centre Pompidou, that uh, this this rasa that was not in the in in the art from the West, but it is still now in Southeast Asia somehow. Uh, yeah, I think I think it is there. I mean, I don't want to. To uh, to divide or to I don't want to make um, like saying that uh, in the east and the west yeah and the, in the east there is still rasa because what I am trying to say is actually through the um, through the experience of Java uh, the way they conceptualize rasa probably you can go uh, to have a more universal dialogue I don't say I'm not saying that. Rasa is not there in the Western uh, culture. I mean, if we read the, tra the spiritual tradition in the West, you will find many people talking about probably not the, not the, not not uh, they don't use the same word, but you will see um, many mystics, philosophers that deal with what I think close to Rasa. Sometimes they call uh, love, sometimes they call it the uh, 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 heart, but if I, can, if I have to mention now some names, it will be from the modern uh, philosopher, philosophy, we can have, uh, I forgot the name now, uh, who talk about gefühl, <laughs> gefühl, gefühl, um, but, um, I forgot the name, I'm sorry. But I think in the West, uh, especially in the mystical tradition, there is uh, a lot of, of um, elaboration also with Rasa, but it is not really, uh, uh, it is not really 
dominated again because the modern system has been very strong and that could be what will happen to Indonesia what we think that an Asian uh, people are still uh, governed by the spirituality by the rasa maybe it will it will disappear in 10 years or probably is already disappearing now so it's not about east and west but it is about uh, the time to uh, to, uh, to again uh, dig again the thought or the intellectual efforts to understand uh, what is missing from our life now Max Scheller. <laughs> okay, I think we'll call it an evening. Thank you for those. <laughs> if I can ask our co chair Beep to come forward and make some presentations. Dear, yeah, are you? Thank you so very much for this very interesting evening. I think it is very important in times where people tend to repeat their opinions in slogans and, and black and white and louder and louder that sometimes there are people, courageous people, who dare to try and dig deeper, uh, deeper for real truth and think out loud and make us maybe slightly uncomfortable, we may not understand everything straight away but I think it's important this happens and I thank you very much for this and I want you um, we have as the Heritage Society we always have our best present ever which is a membership and we would be greatly honored if you would sometimes come and visit us again Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And sorry, I will really keep this short, but I also need to thank the artists who have done something unique in our history. We, for the very first time, we had an exposition connected to the theme of the lecture. And, and the artists, which were Himba Adriani, or Andri, who did the installation, and Nioman Trianavati, who did the pa painting, and Utami Gojali, who did the wonderful photo photography, and Indira, Indira, who did painting as well. They all made these works, especially for tonight, and I would invite you, although it may be late, to either go back inside and have another look, or come back, it will be still there tomorrow and, and Thursday as well. So, uh, and then we have another heritage gift, which is, are, are there still some artists in the, in the audience or have, have they all gone? Andre, are you there? Will you come and get? Great. So, what we are giving you is our Explorer, a book that is very interesting also for Jakartans because you will find all kinds of interesting places in Jakarta. Thank you so much for organizing this wonderful exposition. Okay. And here are the four books. Okay, let's come to a close. We, we have another lecture next month. It's on these little bookmarks. Don't forget to take one with you. It's a folk, uh, focus on Indonesian cinema, Setan Jawa with Asmara Abigail. So if we can meet again on April 17, let's uh, put that in your diary. Seven o'clock for the lecture. We try and finish before nine. And we normally have food available from six o'clock, so look forward to that. Just a quick plug, we have some uh, of these still for sale over there. The price is special offer tonight, 100,000. So go pick up your copy. Every house in hold in Indonesia needs one. So thank you very much for being here. Look forward to seeing you on April 17. Thank you.